Oh, well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to um, tonight's Lectures of Distinction, where we're discussing the important topic of tendon transfers and tenodesis in the foot and ankle. It's important for two reasons. Firstly, some of you may be thinking that tendon transfers are a somewhat niche operation, and it's quite complicated because you have to remember which tendon goes where. But I can reassure you that as long as you understand the basic principles of tendon transfer, you can do any transfer. The second reason is that the countdown to the exam in April has started and tendon transfers are an exam favorite, especially in the clinical section. So the way that we're gonna structure this session is that we're gonna have an instructional talk, we're gonna take some Q and A, and then after that, we're going to discuss a couple of typical exam clinical cases. When you ask your q and I'd be grateful if you can put it in the Q&A box and not the chat box um, in, the, in the bottom uh, icon. So for our talk, we're privileged to have Heath Taylor, who's a surgeon from Bournemouth. In two months, he is going to be our chief, our president of BOFAS. For those of you interested in a career in foot and ankle surgery, Heath runs one of the country's finest foot and ankle fellowships. And in addition to that, you get the sun and seat boost. So thank you very much for joining us, uh, Heath. Thank you very much. So uh, off you go. Thanks, Hero. Um, I will attempt to make the technology work now. So hopefully you're okay. seeing my title slide. Yeah, I can hear you and I can uh, see your slide as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, Hero. So yeah, tendon transfers are obviously very important. Um, as you can see, I now work at what used to be called Bournemouth and Paul and is now called the University Hospitals Dorset since we merged fairly recently and I've no conflicts of interest with this. So the topics I'm going to cover this evening is aiming to a combination of things relevant to clinical practice, but also uh, hopefully relevant for the exam as well. So we'll talk about some definitions what I think the indications are for doing tendon transfers, and then what the criteria are for a successful transfer. And that's important both from a clinical point of view when deciding what tendon or when to do a tendon transfer and which tendon transfer to do, but also in the exam, these tend to get asked um, in the questions. We'll talk a little bit about the biomechanics, how we fix tendon transfers so we can allow early rehabilitation, and then I'm just going to go through some common tendon transfers that I use a lot and also that you guys will see in the exam and illustrate that with some case examples as well. And we've got some video that hopefully will will come across uh, in an understandable way and a little summary at the end. So obviously you start a talk off with the definition and when preparing the talk, I looked up the definition of a tendon transfer and you sort of think, well, it's just moving the the, the insertion from where it used to be to a new place. And that's sort of what it is. So it's the alteration of a muscular tendinous unit, moving its insertion to a new site, restoring absent movement or function. And that's the definition that you see in most of the books. And that applies to the majority of what we think of as a tendon transfer. It doesn't cover everything. And I'll show some examples later on where we will use a free tendon graft such as a hamstring. And that doesn't quite fit into that definition, but I think that would be a reasonable definition to use. And of course, I'm talking about a surgical procedure. I'm not going to go into the non-surgical management of, of uh, these sort of patients, other than to have a slide to say that most patients or all patients really that we're considering operating on should really have had a form of conservative treatment, if for no other re reason than a tendon transfer. It's a biggish operation and you want to feel that they've exhausted all other means. This is an AFO for a foot drop and the majority of patients referred up for a foot drop or with a foot drop for consideration for tendon transfer. Uh, will have already tried an AFO and there's another talk on that I'm not, I'm not going to go into that in any more detail. So what are the indications for carrying out a tendon transfer and nerve injury is a very classic example where you lose partial function so something like a common perineal nerve injury at the fibular neck causing a foot drop <clears throat> and that would be very amenable to a tendon transfer. You can have a similar but slightly more complex injury higher up in the spine and the nerve roots, L4, L5 and S1, and it can give a slightly more mixed picture. But a nerve injury would be a common reason to do a tendon transfer. And trauma as well to muscle units, simply direct trauma to the limb and just losing a large bulk of a skeletal muscle, even if the nerve it retains some sort of function. If you've lost power, then it may be suitable to consider a tendon transfer. 
neurological neurological conditions this uh, the sl clinical slide you can see there is a patient with a shock and right tooth deformity and these patients often uh, will have a weakness that's amenable to a tendon transfer i'll talk a little bit more about that and then of course i think my the the reason i like doing tendon transfers more than anything else is balancing bony deformity and i'll talk about uh, that a little later on in the talk and it's important when you are doing bony deformity not to forget that balancing the soft tissues is a really important part of your deformity correction. So this sort of horribly busy slide with a bunch of arrows is that these are the things that come up in the exam and I'm going to go through these in detail. What are the criteria for a tendon transfer? So I'm going to go through each one of these in a little bit more detail and probably the most important criteria, one of the most important criteria is to have a mobile joint. And this is a patient you can see who's referred up with a foot drop. Now she's got a very neurological looking gait, but if you look at her walking sideways you, or from the, the side view, you can see she's got a foot drop. She's clearly also got an Aquinas deformity and she doesn't even get up to neutral. And it's really important in a case like this, if you're considering doing a tendon transfer to treat her foot drop, that you also consider that you need to be able to achieve that dorsiflexion at the ankle. She has quite a nice gait. Uh, certainly if we were hosting the exam in Bournemouth and she was around, she would definitely be coming up as one of the candidates. Um, you'll see as she turns sideways again, not only has she got her foot drop and her loss of proprioception, but she's also got this, um, the back kneeing that you see with an equine, as you'll see it as she turns sideways and how she flex, she's flexing at her hips to compensate for that and to give her the balance that she needs. Soft tissue equilibrium. If you're going to transfer a tendon, you're relying on that tendon gliding through the soft tissues. Clearly, if you've got infection, you're not going to consider a tendon transfer. But if you've got significant scarring or ongoing inflammatory change, then that's not really an option because the tendon, the transfer won't glide and won't function. And in a trauma situation, Certainly for trauma into the anterior aspect where you're treating a foot drop, it may be worth speaking to the plastic surgeons. And I've had a couple of cases where we've combined a, a tendon transfer with a resurfacing just to try and create a more healthy bed of tissue for the tendon graft to run through. Looking at the excursion of the tendon, whenever you're transferring a tendon, you want to try and match the excursion of the tendon that you're transferring onto the, onto the site that's deficient. And a good example of that would be a tendon transfer for tibialis posterior tendon dysfunction. And the FDL is a really nice tendon to use. It has a really nice excursion, a good long distance of travel. And if you can match the excursion of your donor tendon to the tendon that you're replacing, you will get a more functional result. And then looking at tendon strength, again, the tibialis posterior tendon is a really good example of this when we're using this for a foot drop. The tib post tendon is about the same size as the tibialis anterior tendon that's not functioning. And the muscle belly of the tib post, again, is a reasonable match to the muscle belly of the, the tib ant. And if, again, if you can match the strength of the tendon that you're transferring, you will get a better functional result. However, even if you don't have an active functional tendon, you can get a good tenodesis effect. And what I mean by the tenodesis effect is even if you've got somebody so that lady we saw walking earlier on, she probably won't have a very functional tib post from a contraction point of view, but you just put the tendon in nice and tight, even if she doesn't have an active contraction of the muscle, she will get a tenodesis effect that will hold a mobile joint in a more functional position, and that can often give a better form of a better function. Your donor clearly needs to be expendable. There's no point uh, correcting for a weakness in one area if you simply create a disability uh, as a result of the weakness at your donor site. And a really good example of this is utilizing the knot of Henry. And you will be aware that the FDL and the FHL tendons as they cross under the medial arch have the vinculi at the knot of Henry. And you can certainly take FDL just proximal to the knot of Henry. And I'm not sure I've ever seen patients who complain of weakness of the lesser toes in theory, you should be able to take the FHL uh, in a similar way. I have had the odd patient who has complained of some weakness of the big toe, even though you're taking FHL proximal to the knot of Henry, but the, the vast majority of people don't. And um, this is a good example of, of, in general, you can take the donor tendon without causing weakness as a result of that. And it's really important to have a straight line of pull. 
when we want ropes to go around corners, we put them on pulleys with ball bearings and wheels. And of course, we can't do that when we're doing a tendon transfer. And so where at all possible, it's really important to have a straight line of pull in order to get a good function on your tendon transfer. And I'll, I'll show the clinical applications of that in a while. Synergy. So synergy, again, to get a good function, it's better to ask a muscle and tendon to do something similar to the action that it's already doing. So an example here in the back of the lower leg is the FHL tendon. And FHL is a good tendon graft for reconstructing the Achilles tendon. FHL is already a very strong plantar flexor, plantar flexor of the ankle. So if you're asking it to augment the Achilles, you're asking it to do something it already does. There's little new learning to be done and you get again a more functional and powerful result. And only ask your tendon transfer to do one thing. You can split a tendon into a couple of sections as long as you're asking it to do a single function, but don't expect to be able to split a tendon into two or three parts and expect each part to do a different function. Uh, you will end up with a poor result. And then just the very basics of the biomechanics of tendon transfers. An excursion is very important. You'd all be aware of how muscle contracts where actin and myosin filaments slide over each other. And it's to try to match the excursion as best you can. If you have a tendon that you're transferring that has a bigger excursion than the tendon it's replacing, then in general, it's better to put the tendon in slightly tighter than you think to compensate both for the tendon stretching out, but also for that excessive excursion. And a little bit of extra tension in the tendon will probably compensate for that and still give you a good and functional result. And again, we've talked about tenodesis, even if you're not relying on muscle contraction at all, you can still get a good functional result with a good tight tenodesis in a mobile joint. Talking about the force generation that you can get from a tendon transfer, and you look, this is uh, calculated by a number of means, but the cross-sectional area of the muscle is important. This again is the FHL, which is a really good, strong, beefy muscle. We'll see more examples of that later on. FHL also has a really uh, anatomical muscle fiber orientation for asking it to do what we want it to do when we transfer it. And you can hopefully see on this clinical photograph that these striations of the muscle run longitudinally and they run pretty much in line with the pull of the tendon so that as that muscle contracts, you will get a line of pull very much in the, in the line of the tendon. And again, you'll get more power for the volume of muscle that we have. And it's really important to think about moment arm. So this is a sort of lateral look at the hind foot. You can see the red circle is the center of rotation of the ankle and the red arrow is pointing to where the Achilles inserts. And of course, millions of years of evolution have put the Achilles as far back and round the corner as is possible because that for the same amount of pull will give you the longest lever arm and therefore the most power. <clears throat> and that's how we get so much power from our Achilles. Of course, if we're reconstructing that, such as using an FHL transfer. If you put the FHL transfer as far forward as you can, so just behind the posterior facet of the subtalar joint, you have a very short lever arm. Whereas if you put it much further back, as far back as you can, but not so far that you fracture out the back of the calcaneum, you will have a much better lever arm. And it's always worth thinking about this when you are doing tendon transfers. Another good example of this would be a tib post transfer through the interosseous membrane, which I'll show a similar example later on, the more distal you can put that insertion onto the top of the foot, the better the line of pull you will have, and the, the, the better the lever arm. So how do we fix our tendon transfers? And this, there's been a number of ways down the years, and so I don't do children's orthopedics, but I know some people still will suture tendons over buttons. I think for adults, this is pretty rare to do now they, they tend to get ulceration and I think is now fairly old-fashioned the best fixation is probably bone to bone but in the foot and ankle tendon transfers that we do I can't think of many that I would do a bone to bone fixation that's more the sort of patella tendon for ACL reconstructions certainly tendon to bone gives a really good fixation surface mounting them where you just roughen up the the surface of the bone when you're struggling for length I think it's difficult to get it very tight and you're relying on bone anchors and surface fixation, I think the fixation is poor and you risk the tendon transfer failing. Much better is to try and get the tendon down into a tunnel. And there are different techniques for doing this. You can use a, um, a 
various types of interference screw. There are lots of different types available. And this is a really nice way of both tensioning the tendon transfer and of achieving good fixation. <clears throat> and then tendon to tendon again gives a very good fixation as long as the, the distal end of the native tendon that you're using is soundly attached, which in most cases it is, and various forms of pulvertaft weave can be used and then use locking sutures to hold the tendon in place. And there are uh, sort of more modern techniques. This is a distal biceps uh, tendon attachment device, a bit like a sort of tightrope button um, used for distal biceps. I've actually used this a couple of times to attach tendons into tunnels in the foot and it works very nicely and you can often augment that uh, with an interference screw as well and it gives very nice fixation. So just to go through some common tendon transfers and some case examples to illustrate these basic principles, I'm going to talk about FDL transfer for tip post reconstruction. So this is the classic sort of middle-aged lady with a flat foot and a failing tip post tendon and it's probably one of the most common tendon transfers that you'll see. A good case for exam is foot drop and I'll show, I'll show how we do a tip post transfer. FHL transfer I've talked about for Achilles tendon reconstructions again is a, a reasonably common procedure that we do now. And a case that's relatively unusual but demonstrates the basic principles nicely is a, a, a patient who had a perineal tendon deficiency from rupturing both perineal tendons and I used an FDL transfer. And then finally just to show that it's not all um, the, the sort of classic tendon transfer hamstrings can be used in a number of indications and I'll show a few examples of that as well. So this is the FDL transfer for posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, a really common procedure and a common condition. It has really nice advantages. You've, you've heard all the basic principles of tendon transfer. It has excellent synergy. FDL is doing pretty much what the tib post tendon was doing before. It has an origin for quite close to it. The tendons run very close together. And certainly when you take the FDL just proximal to the knot of Henry, it's really convenient and, and uh, is synergistic in exactly as it should be. The minimal, there's minimal donor site morbidity. You're taking the tendon just proximal to the knot of Henry. So we shouldn't be having any weakness of the lesser toes. And that's something I've, I've really not seen at all. So it ticks that box. The fixation's easy. We like our surgery to be easy and convenient if possible. It minimizes dissection. And uh, we're looking to insert the FDL into the origin of the tip post. And you can see the interference screw there that's inserted into the, uh, into the navicular holding the tendon. And the excursion is good. It has a really nice excursion. It will, it will replicate the anatomy very nicely. Often in this case, we'll do other procedures, calcaneal osteotomy, spring ligament repair, lateral column lengthening and other procedures that go with a flat foot deformity. So of course, don't forget all of your, your other procedures and the bony procedures, but uh, I'm only really talking about tendon transfers here. So tibialis posterior tendon transfer, again, quite a common procedure in foot and ankle practice. Certainly from an exam, you're likely to be shown it in a, uh, or asked about it for a patient with a foot drop that's failed conservative treatment with an AFO, and it's used to balance the foot after a bony correction. The technique that we use, always remember if there is Achilles tightness, if it's only subtle Achilles tendon tightness, I'll do a three-step percutaneous release. You then looking to harvest your, your tib post. So we'll do an ins, uh, a distal harvest just on the medial side of the navicular, take the tib post off absolutely as distally as possible, and then pull it through proximally at the posterior medial border of the tibia, an inch or two above the, the ankle joint, this looks like two tendons, it's one tendon, it's the tip post that I've split because I'm doing a balance transfer. I tend to pull it through and then split it here. And then we're going to make a window in the interosseous membrane and you find that, make that anterior incision pretty much at the same level as the posterior medial incision. You go just medial and behind the tibialis anterior tendon and I'll show you why it's important to make a really big window in the interosseous membrane in a second with a little video clip. And then you pull the tendon through and the sound off, you pull the tendon through. So it should pull nice and easily. If you've made a really nice big window in the interosseous membrane, I use a little curved suture, uh, sort of suture forceps, and the tendon should glide really nicely through a really big hole in the interosseous membrane. If there's any catch at all, you need to stop and think because your tendon's probably running around a corner and that's not what you want. <clears throat> 
the tendon then comes up through the front and you can see this tendon is now sitting anteriorly. This was a case where I was doing a balance transfer. You can pull it through as a single piece, tunnel it subcutaneously and insert that onto the top of the foot, either into the navicular or the cuneiform if you have room. And of course, the more medial or more lateral you go with that will depend on whether you get more of an inversion or eversion pull. I quite like a neurological feat to do a balanced transfer like this. So I'll put the distal medial uh, insertion into the tibialis anterior tendon and the lateral side, I'll use the perineal tendons. And so as that new tendon transfer pulls up, you get a really nice balance to it. So for Achilles tendon reconstructions, the FHL transfer works very nicely. Again, it has very good synergy, which I've talked about already. Donor site morbidity, because we're taking the FHL transfer usually at the back of the ankle, at the distal end of the incision. Of course, if you take it more distally, either under the arch of the foot or even occasionally, some people use a technique to bridge a large defect in the Achilles where they'll take the tendon uh, at the big toe, then you may get more, more donor site morbidity. But the fixation is really easy, we're there anyway, and the excursion is good, and it can be used to augment the Achilles repair. And this is a good example of this. So this is a, an FHL. You can see the FHL muscle is the beef to the heel. You can see this chronically ruptured Achilles tendon that had healed, but it had healed long, and the FHL is harvested at the fiber osseous tunnel. I whip the end of the tendon. You need about 2.5 centimeters of tendon that goes into a bone tunnel and then is fixed with an interference screw. And you can see that being stabilized here nicely. Getting the tension right, again, slightly tighter than you think, but not too tight. In general, it's just at the muscular tendinous junction is at the top of the drill hole, and that seems to work quite well. You just want a little bit of resting plantar flexion. If you're not sure about the tension and when you start doing this procedure, a good, a good tip is just before you prep and drape the leg is just examine the other side where if they've got a normal Achilles tendon, you can get a feel for what their normal resting tension is. So this is the, uh, an interesting case I saw a couple of years ago. This is a cross-sectional MRI scan just above the level of the ankle. And if you look just behind the fibula, there aren't any perineal tendons. There's just this massive sort of muscle and scar tissue. And this guy was a Marine who was running the London Marathon. He felt a pop at about 20 miles and then a second pop with a bit more pain at about 24 miles. And he'd ruptured both of his perineal tendons. And um, he was treated as a, a sprained ankle because he presented mainly with ankle instability. And you'll see it's his right foot. And as he walks, he felt his ankle was unstable. And he had this, what I think is sort of called a perineus minus gait. So he has just this very subtle sort of inversion flick of his right foot as he walks. But he was a young, fit, active guy and this had made his ankle unstable. He'd lost all of his eversion power and therefore was unstable. You'll notice also that his heel alignment was very, was sort of the varus side of neutral. He's not a cava varus foot, but he's certainly not a normal valgus heel alignment. And he was a subtle varus. And I think that's probably what's predisposed him to the perineal tendon problems that he had. And this is the procedure I did for him. So I did a calcaneal osteotomy because of his heel varus. Whenever I have perineal tendon problems, unless they really are in valgus, I will tend to do a lateral displacement calcaneal osteotomy. And then I reconstructed his, tib, his, his perineal tendons using the FDL transfer, which you can see there. And then the distal fixation, I put it into a tunnel into the, into the base of the fifth metatarsal. You can see the sutures whip, uh, whip stitched onto the end of the tendon so we could get a nice tension. We put an interference screw in. The fixation was okay, but it wasn't brilliant. But because he'd ruptured uh, just below the fibula, I actually had a nice distal stump of perineus brevis that I could use to reinforce the repair and we had a really good repair with him and so we were able to rehabilitate him really quickly and this is him only about three months post-op he's still getting going but you can see his foot is much more balanced he's lost that inversion flick his wounds have healed nicely heel alignment now is just a smidge of valgus which i think for him with his problem was probably about right and he's he's uh, using my rigorous system of follow-up that he's not been back for a couple of years uh, he goes down as a success and he was happy when he left and then just to show uh, use of hamstrings. So this is a, a hamstring, the tendon stripper that the knee surgeons use. And you get this nice long bit of semitendinosis and you can also take uh, gracilis as well. So you can use both. And hamstrings are really useful and they can be used in lots of situations. They can be used to 
repair a really large defect in the Achilles tendon where you're not able to obtain a primer repair and where you feel FHL on its own won't give a strong enough repair. I quite like using it for a tibialis anterior tendon rupture because they're often quite degenerate and they present late and I think are very difficult to obtain a primary repair. They can be used for lateral ankle ligament reconstruction as well. I'll show you an example of that. And they have good advantages. The uh, hamstrings, you just get a good bit of rope and it's biological rope. So rather than using a fiber tape or some other form of um, non-biological material to fill a gap, I think the hamstrings works very nicely. The main disadvantage is that you do, you might need to have a knee surgeon in theater, which is never much fun. Um, this is an example with the Achilles. So the red arrow was showing the distal stump of the Achilles folded distally. And on the right of the screen, you can see just the, the proximal stump folded out of the way. So I've done an FHL transfer, much as you've seen before. You see that lovely, big, strong vascular muscle, which is really nice when you've got this slightly um, avascular Achilles tendon. Again, you've seen that technique with the interference screw. You can just see the top of the screw going into the top of the calcaneum. And then here's my hamstring graft. And I used a double strand, so semitendinosus and gracilis. The red arrow is showing the distal stump, which I've woven the hamstring graft through. And you just lock that in place with some sutures. If you had a distal pull off, you could always put it through a drill hole across the top of the calcaneum and that would work very nicely as well. And then you can see you get this really nice, good length of tendon that allows you to fill a really large gap. I keep all of the scar tissue from the Achilles tendon, all that stuff with the, um, the surgical marker pen on, that's all scar tissue but weave the new hamstrings through proximally, get your tension right again. So again, not too tight, but just tight enough. And then I suture the scar tissue over the back. I don't think it adds much to strength because it's pretty poor tissue, but it does help with the soft tissue equilibrium. I think it helps the, the tendon to glide nicely under the skin and you get a really solid repair and you can rehabilitate the patients quite early. Hamstring is quite useful for lateral ligament reconstruction as well. So failed brostrum procedures, if you don't want to use a fiber tape. And again, you can pass it through drill holes and use uh, interference screws and uh, in a similar fashion. And just to finish on a couple of good examples that if we host the exam in Bournemouth, they will both definitely be coming. So this is a really nice young lady with some learning difficulties and you can see her gait is pretty terrible. She's got this left-sided contractor and she's got a sort of Aquinas, Cavus, Varus, Plantaris deformity, which she walks remarkably well on. And she was referred up to see what we could do to help her gait. <clears throat> and of course, this is a fixed bony and joint deformity. And of course, you, you tend to think, well, what bony and joint operations are we going to do? We're clearly going to have to release her Achilles tendon. And if you look at her weight bearing x-rays, you can see on the lateral view, this looks like one of those x-rays people take wearing high heels, but that's her weight bearing and you've seen how she walks. And I think we can get this foot plantar grade with a triple fusion, taking wedges out, a Lambrinidae type fusion with an Achilles release. But if you look at that AP X-ray of the foot, you can see how the navicular has really been pulled around the medial side of the head of the talus with a medial contracture. We're going to have to release that as part of our triple. So while we're releasing the tib post tendon from the medial side of the navicular, why not pass it through the interosseous membrane and do a tip post transfer? And when we've got her foot plantar grade, she may not even have a foot drop as well. And I think it's a really nice augment to a, an otherwise, a, a mostly a bone and joint procedure. And this is another young lady who was referred and her referral just said, this lady's got flat feet. What can we do to help her? And you can see how she walks. Not only has she got flat feet, but she's got a pretty awful biomechanics. She's got valgus knees. She's clearly got a profound flaccid foot drop. And so again, as well as dealing with her, the shape of her feet, I suspect the thing that will help her gait more than anything is not giving her slightly better shaped feet, which again, I'm sure would be a triple fusion um, for her planus or for her planar valgus, but actually correcting her foot drop will probably make her gait much better. It will prevent her having to step so high, but be much more um, from an energy efficiency point of view, she'll be much more efficient if she didn't have her foot drop. So again, don't just think about the shape of the foot, think about using the tendons, to, the tendon transfers to get balance as well. So in summary, tendon transfers are certainly a major part of foot and ankle practice. And as Hero said, they're a major part of the exam. And it's really important to know how to, the basic principles and how to use them. 
and do use the basic principles. Uh, it's really important both uh, when you're deciding which tendon to use and then when doing the surgery. And it's really helpful when you're thinking about planning your surgery. Always remember to balance your bony corrections. It's really easy to say, oh, this is the deformity. This is the bone and joint. I will reset to correct that deformity. And don't forget that you then need to balance it as well, both from a functional point of view, but to prevent the deformity progressing possibly onto the next joint. Really try and get good fixation. Tendons like to move early and the earlier you move them, the better the functional result will be. And I'm just gonna finish by showing you this slide. So this is the sun, sunrise over Bournemouth Pier. Um, as you know, I have great honor of taking over as president in a few weeks. And given the, the previous 18 months fiasco, hopefully we will be able to have a meeting in Bournemouth and you will all be very welcome in March of, uh, of next year. So uh, thank you very much, Hero. Thank you, Heath, that was absolutely beautiful. I mean, I think the thing that came across with the cases and the talk that you gave are the sort of key eight principles of tendon transfers. And in each of those patients, you're basically following those sort of eight principles and coming up with what, what is the best sort of um, um, best uh, tendon transfer to do for the patient. I just wanted, I just, I think it, one of the questions is um, uh, about the um, FDL transfer and basically what happens to the toes. Can you just repeat, I know you said it already, but can you just repeat what happens to the toes? Why are the toes not affected when the FDL is taken? And how do you actually minimize the impact on the, on the lesser toes? Yeah, sure. So, um, so the knot of Henry is, this is an anatomical structure. It's named the knot of Henry, which is where FDL and FHL cross each other. Um, under the, it's sort of underneath, I guess it's sort of almost under and just distal to the undersurface of the medial cuneiform. And as they cross each other, they're connected. And although everyone thinks of FHL and FDL as being separate tendons, there are vinculi that join the two tendons together. So if you take either of those tendons proximal to that, you will still have the other tendon pulling on the vinculi. So if you take FDL proximal to the vinculi, and it's, you know, it's, uh, whenever, you give, whenever you talk about this, it's very hard to do this without everybody sitting there wiggling their toes. So I'm now gonna make everybody wiggle their toes. And you can't wiggle your big toe without your lesser toes moving and vice versa. And that's because of the vinculi and the knot of Henry. And certainly taking FDL, I don't think I've ever had anybody say their lesser toes were weak. I don't think the patients even notice it. I have definitely had patients where I've taken the FHL behind the ankle, so as I showed, and have complained of having a slight weakness in the big toe. So I don't know whether some people don't have a vinc the vinculi, I'm not sure, or whether the FHL, there is clearly a small group of patients who do miss their FHL. It seems to be they get used to it. I don't think they develop any deformity of the big toe. I've not seen that but that's the reason why it's the vinculi at the knot of Henry is the answer. Yeah, that's brilliant. Have you ever thought about just since you're there anyway, what about just put a side to side yeah. uh, Tina Disa, just, just put a couple of sutures in yeah. to just link so, the two, you know, and then you don't have that problem. Um, do you ever do that? No, so, so if I'm taking FDL, I don't because it would be really easy to do. You're quite right. <clears throat> if I'm taking FDL, I don't because I've never had that as a weakness. Once or twice, I've, I've taken FHL at the knot of Henry. And in that situation, I do only because I've had the odd patient who's complained of the weakness. And for some reason, it seems to be an FHL thing. But you're quite right. There is no reason not to do it. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's a good yeah, it's a Great. Good so uh, just a couple of questions about uh, a tip post transfer <clears throat> or a foot drop. No, yes. I mean, first of all, I mean, that, that transfer itself breaks the rule of synergy, doesn't it? But, but it at does. the end of the day, there, is, there isn't anything else because normally in a foot drop, every, all the extensors are gone no, normally in that situation. That's right. No, yeah. Um, uh, but when you actually do the transfer, what happens then? Because we're so obsessed about tip post rupture and a flat foot deforming, and yet we're, we're taking the whole of tip post. I mean, do, do you ever see problems with the foot 
um, collapsing into into valgus. So yeah, so th this again, I mean, I, I don't know if that's your question or someone sent it. It's a great question. It's a question that people ask whenever I do a tip post transfer. One of the trainees often brings that up. The answer is, I can't think I've ever seen anybody collapse their arch after I've done a tip post transfer. I don't think I've ever seen it, and I have often wondered why. And I think it's probably because. Their foot shape otherwise is good. Their spring ligament is normal and is intact. And the capsule of the tail and navicular joint isn't breached. And you, I just don't think you see it. Um, I, I don't know whether you've well, ever seen it. but well, I, maybe we're just not following them up for long enough. You know, maybe 20 Well, maybe, yeah, maybe. Maybe, maybe yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I really haven't. And I, and I honestly don't know why that's the case. <clears throat> and it defies kind of, you know, all so, kind of basic principles. No, and, and I don't know why either. And I always yeah. go on and mutter that about the spring ligament. And, but I, I don't really know why, because of course it should, the, the, the arch should collapse. But I think tib tibialis posterior tendon dysfunction in the sort of classic, the sort of slightly overweight middle-aged lady, which is the group that we're, that, you know, that we're talking about, who get flat feet. There's a sort of cause and effect discussion to be had with that. Is are these, you know, people with a physiological cava varus don't get tib post dysfunction; they get perineal tendinopathy. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit of a chicken and egg: is does the tib post go first, or is it actually the flat foot and the spring ligament stretching? And it's only after a while that the tib post goes. And so we're doing tendon transfers in people who don't have that. So uh, there is a sort of answer to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so let's take the example of um, that patient with the equinus contracture with the chronic uh, foot drop. Um, somebody, somebody's asked, you know, so if they've got an equinus contracture, then presumably the syndesmosis is going to be contracted and also narrowed. And so part of the limitation of dorsiflexion might be the syndesmosis. So have you ever had to actually release the syndesmosis to get the ankle uh, up to neutral in addition to your uh, uh, gastroc slide or tendo Achilles release? So that's a great question that I've never thought about. No, I've never had to release the syndesmosis. I guess it would happen if you had, if it may be something if it was a post-traumatic case where you had where you had the syndesmosis, particularly if the syndesmosis had been fixed over tightened. I've certainly had... So I've definitely had patients who were in Aquinas as a result of over-tightened syndesmosis, usually when they've used the screws as a lag screw rather than as a positional screw. I don't think you can do it with a tightrope. Um, I've never had to do it in, you know, in a neurological foot drop, whether it's a compranial nerve palsy or a spinal injury. No, I haven't. I've certainly sometimes had to do more than just an Achilles release. I've once or twice had to do a more extensive posterior release, posterior ankle capsule. I have never, ha I've never released the syndesmosis. I'd, maybe I should be, but I've, it's not something I've had to do. Yeah, and um, what, what, what do you say to the patient? So, you know, if, you, if you're doing a three cut TA release, do you warn yeah. them about weakness in, in plantar flexion? So whilst, you know, whilst they're gonna get <clears> their dorsiflexion, flexion, yeah. they're not gonna get as much push off strength. So it's a kind of a balance, it's a trade off. Do, do you actually tell uh, them? I do, I do. And I think I, it's interesting, I, I, I've done so many, of the three-step percutaneous releases. So if it's just a, so that lady I showed with the very neurological looking at, not the girl with the hemiplegia, but the, um, I think in that case where you're only looking for a five, 10 degrees more dorsiflexion, I think a three-step release, which, you know, you do carefully and you try not to get the tendon to rupture. I, I, anyone who's done enough of those, we have all had it where it suddenly goes with a sort of terrifying ping. And the first time it happens, it's awful. And you think, oh God, but actually, do you know, they're just fine. And I think it's because the paratenon is intact. I don't think the whole tendon ruptures and they still retain some integrity. And there's the odd one who's been a little bit weak in plantar flexion, I would agree, but it's actually been less of a problem than probably I thought it would be. Even when you hear, when you feel it go pop in theater and you think, gosh, I've pushed a bit hard. Um, the more severe contractors, like the girl I showed with the really severe Aquinas, I wouldn't do that as a percutaneous release. I do that as an open, uh, I do a longitudinal incision because otherwise you can't close the wound, it must be a longitudinal incision. And I do a, I actually do a coronal Z rather than a, than a sagittal plane Z. So I use a 10 blade in the coronal plane and do a long sort of fillet of the tendon and you get a nice long flat surface, but I do a, an open really, an open 
open release and almost the last thing you do before you sew the wounds up is put the Achilles back together again because I think it's really hard to judge the tension otherwise. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. So really good question um, um, about, uh, clearly uh, they've seen an EHR attrition rupture. And I, 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 I have to say that I, I've, seen a, uh, I've seen several traumatic EHR uh, injuries that were missed and uh, presented late. <clears throat> So in that situation, so let's say we have a patient with a late uh, EHR attrition rupture or, or um, mm. uh, a traumatic injury. Yeah. Um, should we think about a tendon transfer or should we just go ahead and just say, you know what, we'll just fuse your toe? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a great question, isn't it? And it's very individual to the patient. So the most common reason for that would be somebody dropping something on their foot and a piece of glass drops on the foot. And so an attrition rupture would be, from a degenerate midfoot and it, it goes over the over an osteophyte i think that's impossible to achieve a primary repair because the tendon is absolutely ragged and by the time they come to you you won't be able to repair it they're often older patients and effusion may be an option um i think if you want to repair that tendon you've got to use some i would probably use one i might use one of the hamstrings um i quite like using hamstrings for that um i think if it's again i think if it's it's a laceration the classic one is the you know i i smashed a plate and it dropped on my foot and i got a little cut they go to a and e and they put three stitches in it and three months later they can't move their toe that's usually younger patients and i will try and reconstruct it again i quite like using a free graft i'll try and just bridge the gap with a with a um either with a bit of hamstring. I mean, there's a technique described, you can take a little bit of the Achilles, plantaris if there is a plantaris. So anything that will bridge the gap. I think trying to get a primary repair, unless you're there within a week or two, I think is really difficult. Yeah. What about what about using EDL? Because of all the definitions of expendable, EDL yeah. is definitely expendable. Could we could we just sort of flip over one of the EDLs across? Yeah, you, know, you, and, you uh, can do. It's not it's it's the different. It's not very big. That's the only problem. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's certainly an option as well. Definitely. Yeah, brilliant. Actually, this is this is a really good question. Actually, and it's probably been asked in the flatfoot section. And it's what to do with the, so this is for uh, a tip post reconstruction. So yeah. we've got a, a really sort of, let's say a tip post rupture and uh, you cut out the disease bit of the tip post essentially. What, what, what do you tend to do with the stump that's left? Because, you know, it might have a bit of muscle, it might have a bit of function left in it. Do you plumb that into FDL to give it a bit more uh, extra power? Yeah. Or how, how do you decide what to do with that? Or do you it's never- a, you know? It's a great question again, and it's something that, that, that does get asked. Do you know, I almost always just chop it out and replace it with the FDL. Um, I think if you've got a younger patient, so it might be somebody who's, you know, with a spring ligament injury and a bit of a bit of tip post tendonitis, and your FDL is, is an augment, then I might keep the tip post. But in the, the the by far the most common group is this, you know, this middle-aged, slightly overweight ladies with just with a with a failing tip post tendon. I don't keep any of it. I just chuck, I just chop it out. I think there is an argument to keep it, and I get that. I worry that it's a cause of pain because the tip post tendon, certainly in the, the classic sort of stage two foot where the tendon's not ruptured, not, I know the classification is not based on rupture, but where the tendon is intact, the tendon is a driver of pain. And particularly if you, when you open the sheath, you get that little gush of inflammatory fluid I just want that all gone because I think the FDL transfer is good. And I worry that I'm leaving something that is a, is a possible cause for pain. So I, I, I chop it out, but may, maybe that's overly aggressive, but that's what I've tended to. I, 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 I do exactly the same. I mean, yeah. in, the, in the sense that weakness of FDL isn't really the problem, is it? You know, it, it's, yeah, it, it's right. sort of, it's late, latent arch collapse and that yeah. with, with well, new methods of augmentation, essentially the spring ligaments, we've actually countered that. Yeah. But I have heard people say, well, actually, you know, sometimes I will plummet in and, and I determine that based on the excursion. So, so if, if we draw an analogy with a rotator cuff, it depends. Usually in a chronic rupture, the tip post muscle is atrophied and pretty useless. So you can't pull on it. When you yank on it, there's no give in it. So it's a pretty useless muscle. So there's no point plumbing it in. But so I have heard people say, well, yeah. if, if there is a bit of give in it and there is a bit of excursion, it's really on, then sometimes I'll plummet in and just, you know, why, why not? You know, but, but as, as a general rule, I agree. Uh, yeah, so I've heard that argument. Yeah. I mean, you know, as with all things, it's uh, crying out for a study, isn't it? Somebody needs to randomise it. And um, yeah. 
you know, exactly. in, in those that haven't ruptured, the two A's that, that, that have got an intact tendon that's got a bit of excursion, you know, yeah. do half of them chop it out and half of them keep it and see how they do. Um, yeah. Be a nice little study. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we'll have one final question and then we'll do a couple of exam cases. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Keith, yeah. Um, so it's really just a, a question. I, I, and I guess it depends on which unit you work in. But um, the, the question is really about gait analysis. Do, do you see any kind of utility in terms of uh, using gait analysis if we have access to it uh, for a neurologic foot? So presumably a neuromuscular foot. Does it add anything? It's a really good question. So I, I'm probably the wrong one to ask because I don't have access to gait analysis. So that corridor that you saw my patients walking up and down with me videoing them, that's my gait analysis. And I just make them walk up and down again and again and again and look at it. And I, it undoubtedly must have a role. Um, I don't feel I miss it, but maybe that's because I don't have it. And maybe if I had it and then didn't have it, I would miss it. But I don't know what in the gait analysis in a gait lab I would see that would make me change what I do, certainly from a surgical planning point of view, when deciding which tendon transfers to do. I will certainly sometimes use uh, nerve conduction studies or EMGs, particularly if I'm not sure what's working, what's not, particularly patients with learning difficulties where it's difficult to isolate muscle contraction. But I, do I think is necessary? I think it probably has a role. I think it's really useful for research. Um, I don't miss it, but it probably has a role. Do you use it? Um, no, I don't have access to it. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to say something slightly controversial, but it's, it is philosophical. It, 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 you know, Gates analysis is like pedobrography. It depends on how you utilize it. So, so what pedobrography and also gait analysis doesn't do is you can't stick a patient in the gait lab and say, right, analyze that for me and give me the answer. What do I need to do with this patient? No, well, gait analysis <coughs> actually answers a very specific question that we have in the way that pedobrography can answer a very specific question, a clinical question, you know, but it doesn't give you the answer. It's not like an MRI scan where basically it tells you what to do, isn't it? You know, um, <coughs> so, so I, I, I don't have access to it in my hospital, but I could have access to it if I wanted to, but I, I don't utilize it in my normal day to day. Practice. I would be very surprised if gait analysis changed yeah. the procedures I was considering doing in a neurological foot. Yeah, great. Okay, so let's do a couple of quick cases. Okay? Yeah. And uh, so, uh, uh, typical exam uh, cases. So 30 year old man involved in a road traffic accident four years previously, where he sustained a posterior dislocation of the hip and a partial sciatic nerve palsy. So it, he's had a foot drop for the last four years or so, and he's coming to us to look for more function. So really focusing on the exam, what would you expect the candidate to demonstrate during their clinical examination of this patient? So, I mean, usually that will be presented as a, as a sort of watching, it's the sort of Ministry of, Ministry of Silly Walks question, isn't it? So they'll usually say, watch this patient walk. Um, I mean, I'm not an examiner, but we, we examine in our local mock exam and I'm sure the principles haven't changed since I did it. Um, they'll usually ask the patient to walk. I think one tip I was given that I think is really useful is as well as looking at the patient, it's really useful to look at their shoes, look at what else they've got, someone like that will probably have already taken his shoes off and be asked to turn up in a pair of shorts and just hiding around the back of his chair will be his AFO. And I think that's a really nice thing to spot if you're gonna have a discussion. So I would certainly look at that. And I think the things you're looking for, particularly in a, in a foot drop gait, which is, is probably what you're, you're talking about is, you know, is it a high stepping gait? Now, if it's just because he's had a nerve injury to the lower limb, it's probably a fairly typical, just a foot drop, the sort of foot slapping down. It's also look for, you know, is this more of an ataxia, loss of proprioception type of gait? So they may still have a foot drop, but they may be more related to things like neurological conditions, peripheral neuropathy, shock and marrow tooth, this sort of thing. And it can be really variable. Obviously look for scars. And I think in somebody like this, particularly if they've had that hip, you know, you want to look not just the scars around the foot, but really the whole of the lower limb and the hip and look for muscle wasting. And if he's had a, you know, this is a, a, a almost like a polytrauma case potentially. So if you're given that as opposed to a hip dislocation, you know, look at the gluteal muscles, the hamstrings, the quads, all of that, as well as looking of course at the calf and the, 
the muscle carbons. Is it unilateral or bilateral? If it's bilateral, it's probably more of a sort of systemic neurological condition. And limb alignment, the leg generally, the hip, the knee, any contractures, as well as the hind foot and the foot shape generally, of course, you're going to do a neurovascular examination. I was, people always sort of do the neurovascular exam in orthopedics right at the end. I thought almost the first thing I do is I put my fingers on the pulses of the foot because if they're not there, I'm not going to operate on them. It's, and I don't, and it means I don't forget how to do it. It's how, what I was taught to do. And it's a, it's a sort of habit, but it's probably quite a good habit. And then let's say we've seen this patient, he's got this foot drop, you know, what's his range of movement in his joint. So examine what's working and what's not working. Is it just his ankle dorsiflexors that aren't working? Is tib post working? And it's important to know how to isolate tib post. You have to assess inversion power, but in plantar flexion. So even if he has got some tib and power, you're switching that off. And is his ankle, is his ankle, does his ankle have a good range of movement? Can he get dorsiflexion beyond neutral? Um, and look at the soft tissues, you know, has he got a leg that looks like it will tolerate, what, four or five big scars, <clears throat> or four or five small scars, which makes a big scar, um, and, and allow a tendon transfer to slip through. And then watch them walk and look at the function, look at the, how energy efficient the gait is. Um, it's really exhausting having to lift your leg up really high to not trip over your toes all the time. It's particularly exhausting if your quads don't work very well. So that's the sort of things I'm looking for. Yeah, How that's that brilliant. And, and to be seen to be doing the silver ski all test to be able to actually delineate between a gastro, a gastro or tendo Achilles contractor, isn't it? Right. So but, I think, yeah. yeah, I think that absolutely. So silver scale test, absolutely to see whether it's just a gastro or an Achilles. My, you know, I can't give you any data. I think people that develop an Aquinas contracture just a result of having a long-term foot drop, it's usually the Achilles. I, I found I, it would be rare for me to do a medial gastroc release with a tip post transfer. I'm almost always releasing the Achilles because I think you, you never quite get the pull on the tendon transfer that you think you're going to get. I think you often never put it in quite as tight. And I think you, re you want really good ankle dorsiflexion. And even if you put it in a bit tight so they, they end up with a bit less plantar flexion, unless they're a ballet dancer, there's not much in life you need full plantar flexion from, but they really like the fact that they don't have to lift the leg up, so. Yeah. Is, is, it worth, um, is it worth sort of documenting and just sort of saying that um, I've checked it post and it's got an MRC grading of five out of five, because you know you read in textbooks and say, if you do, if you do transfer a tendon that it dropped one MRC grade. I, I mean, I don't know how much of that is actually true. <coughs> No, I, I haven't observed that necessarily. I mean, you know, how, how do you even quantify yeah. it? But so, I, I guess it's what's written in the textbooks. So I think I think that's right. I, I, I you know, I meant to say it in talk when I talked about strength, but I, it's probably relevant to have not said it. So I think you're right. I think that's way too much of a very didactic that you drop from five to four. It's never quite that precise. And equally, you can transfer tendons that are already a little bit weak because you get that really nice tenodesis effect. And I've treated, I've treated a foot drop with an ankle fusion for various reasons. And if you just fuse the ankle at a neutral position in somebody with a foot drop, for whatever reason, I had a patient had a very degenerate ankle and a foot drop. Well, I fused the ankle. The thing they loved was not the fact that their ankle pain had got better. They loved the fact that their foot drop had gone away because the foot was just held at a neutral position. Um, and that's the sort of ultimate tenodesis. It's the, you know, an, an arthrodesis. But um, so yeah. I think you're right, you lose power, but I, I, the tenodesis effect is a really useful thing as well. Um, I'm actually gonna, rather than do the second case, there is actually a, a really good question here that I'm gonna go back to. And it's in reference to the indications and, and patient selection. So the question says, is rheumatoid arthritis a contraindication for tendon transfer? Yeah, so, so, uh, so, or is it, is it a bit like the hand? You do an ultrasound scan prior to the tendon transfer or is clinical examination enough? So I guess, I guess the question is twofold. One is, are we worried about, uh, more worried about transferring tendons in the rheumatoid patient? And, and understandably, there's many reasons why. Um, and do we need to check the, their tendons out, make sure that the tendons that we're proposing to transfer isn't tendinopathic 
asymptomatic. So I think this is another, I have to say the questions have been great. It's a really great question. And that's a, a, a scenario I've, I've been faced with before. So I don't think it's a contraindication to doing a tendon transfer because, I, and I think that more now than if I've only been a consultant for 17 years, but if when I'd started or when I was a trainee, I think it may have been a bit more of a contraindication. So particularly a good example is, it sounds like they're referencing the sort of flat foot, you know, if, and that would be a common thing to see. So if you had some, a rheumatoid with a, with a tib post dysfunction and, a, and an acquired flat foot, can you still do an FDL transfer and a calcaneal osteotomy? I think you can. I think I would have a, I would have done an MRI scan anyway, and I would want to know that the FDL and FHL were normal and that the disease was only affecting the tib post. And I think you would want to make sure that their rheumatoid was really well controlled. So they need to be on all their biologics or whatever they need and methotrexate and all that other stuff that's controlling them from getting progression. And I would also know from my MRI scan that they didn't have any degenerate joint disease. So if they met all of those criteria, and particularly in a younger rheumatoid, I would definitely go for a joint preserving procedure. And yeah, you say to them, look, there's a risk. You may be back in five years, 10 years, 15 years. And you know what? If you do come back and there's a problem, we can just fuse your tail and navicular joint. But if they can keep their tail and navicular joint mobile for another 10 years with an inflammatory arthropathy, I think that's a really good thing. So I think it's a great question. So it doesn't, it doesn't stop me doing it. It just makes me think about it more and make sure that they are suitable for it. But quite a nice combination of procedures. If, if you can't do a tendon transfer, say an FDL transfer, say you do an MRI and all of their three post-remedial hind foot tendons are all synovitic, and you've got a bit of degenerate change. I think a really nice combination of procedures is a calcaneal osteotomy to correct for the hind foot valgus and a talonavicular fusion because you're only fusing one joint. It's a relatively easy procedure. It stabilizes the medial column. So they maintain their arch height um, and you correct the hind foot valgus. And that would be, you know, if I, that, that would be a reasonable combination of, of procedures that I would do for that. Yeah, thanks, Heath. Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, that's one of the greatest evolutions and, you know, changes in yeah. foot and ankle surgery, isn't it? Is, is the fact yeah. that rheumatoid biologic control is so good yeah. now that we do need to look towards more joint preservation. Yeah, and the absolutely. old school of, you know, rheumatoids are, are, are more complex or they've got poor soft tissues. That's not necessarily the case. And okay. if you, if, well, yeah, good. I, I think we better wrap things up now. Um, so before you log off, everyone, um, in the chat box, there is the your code for your feedback and your certificates. So please note that down if you haven't got that already. It's in the chat box. And the next session is the second ankle fracture session, um, which is going to be this Friday at 8 p.m. So that's going to be the session this Friday, 8 p.m. Not next week. It's going to be this week on Friday on the 12th of uh, February. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. Thank you very much, Heath. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Hero. Yep. Okay. Take care, everyone. Stay safe and uh, see you. See you when I see you. See you shortly. Okay. Bye bye.